um, <laughs> I've loosely called these um, Wednesday Wonderings because it seemed like a good title just to put down as something. Um, so um, the service is a bit more informal than we would normally have. And so welcome to you all. And the reflection is very short. And then we're going to ask some wondering questions and we'll see what wonderings we have. Now, I'll always say, if we're wondering, we're never wrong because it's personal to us. And so don't feel afraid to say that you might say the wrong thing because it's your personal opinion and people will respect that as well. So if you feel brave enough or uh, the spirit's leading you in that way, please share your wonderings um, with us later on in the service. Let's join in prayer. Wonderful God, as we gaze at the miracle of your world, intricate and interconnected, huge in scope, microscopic in detail, we are amazed. And we wonder that you love each one of us, seeing us, knowing us, and filling us with the breath of life. You hold us in being moment by moment. You help us to worship as you as mystery and to hug you as a friend and with you to care for the whole of creation. God of truth, we bring to you our sorrows for our sins. Forgive us and strengthen us as we pray, for we are truly sorry. Living God, we cho you choose to save, not to judge, to forgive, not to condemn, to turn towards, not away, and to show us by your nature, not to hide. You allow us to know you to love you and to share with you for all these things and more. We are truly thankful. Amen. Amen. We're going to start by singing a, a song um, and it's a newer song. It's called Vagabonds and it's by a man called Stuart Townsend. So um, please um, dance along as you want. I'll share my screen and um, we'll enjoy.
and dreamers and schemers And come all you restless just searching for home Movers and shakers and givers and takers The happy, the sad, the lost and alone Come self-sufficient with wearied ambition And come those who feel at the end of the road Accusers, abusers, the heard and ignored Come to the feast, there is room at the table Come, let us meet in this place With the king of all kindness Who welcomes us in with the wonder of love And the power of grace Come to the feast, there is room at the table Well, that woke us all up. Um, our reading today is, is taken from last week's um, lectionary reading. So it's from John 3, chapter, John chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. And I'm reading it from the contemporary English version. There was a man named Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee and a Jewish leader. And one night he went to Jesus and said, Sir, we know that God has sent you to teach us. You couldn't work those miracles unless God were with you. And Jesus replied, I tell you for certain that you must be born from above before you can see God's kingdom. Nicodemus asked, how can a grown man ever be born a second time? And Jesus answered, I tell you for certain that before you can get into the God's kingdom, you must be born not only by water, but by the spirit. Humans give life to their children, yet only God's spirit can change you into a child of God. Don't be surprised when I say that you must be born from above. Only God's spirit gives new life. And the spirit is like the wind that blows wherever it wants. You can hear the wind, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. And Jesus replied, how can you be a teacher of Israel and not know these things? I tell you for certain that we know what we're talking about because we have seen it ourselves, but none of you will accept what we say. If you don't believe when I talk, talk to you about the things on air, how can you possibly believe if I talk to you things about things in heaven? No one has gone up to heaven except the Son of Man who came down from there, and the Son of Man must be lifted up, just as that metal snake was lifted up by Moses in the desert. And then everyone who has faith in the Son of Man will have eternal life. God loved the people of this earth, this world, so much that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who has faith in him will have eternal life and never really die. God did not send his son into the world to condemn its people. He sent them to save them. That passage is iconic. It's got a verse in it that is famous. They're probably the most famous of all Bible verses. And people who have been church goers for a long time may have a secret feeling that we ought to know more about God than we actually do. Maybe we have a, a whole lot of ideas about God and some questions and we feel embarrassed to ask them because we think we should know the answers. Or maybe worse, maybe we've given up even asking the questions. And maybe this is how Nicodemus felt. He was a Pharisee, he was an expert in Jewish law and Jesus had some vital experience of God that intrigued him. He was dying to find out if 
Jesus was real and he had questions to ask. So he went by night to talk to Jesus, maybe hoping nobody would notice him. And he was going to ask for maybe easy, uh, easy answers, um, but I think he was disappointed. He was told that he can't see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. And that got Nicodemus really confused. The answer Jesus gives, however, does change him. And he's transformed and seeing everything differently. The story kind of suggests that if we hunger for God and take enough risks, God can hear us and meet us in person, just like Nicodemus. We may not get an answer we understand all at once, but it might seem at first like silence, but simply being heard by God as an individual can help us get unstuck. By simply being heard by God as an individual, we can realize that we, we count, that he loves us just as we are. What question would you like to ask for Jesus? Maybe it's a big question. Maybe it's a very personal question. And as we begin this new venture of hybrid worship, which gives us a chance not only to meet in person, but to meet online. Maybe this is the very passage that we needed to get us started. As we start in a new way of being church, in a way, the church is being born again. So I'm going to ask you some wondering questions and I would like you to discuss them. Share your wonderings. So, I've got four questions and these four questions will be shared every week. My first question is, what is the best part of the story for you? What is the best part of the story for you? The second question is, what is the most important part of the story for you? The third question is, which part of the story would you like to miss out? And why would you want to miss out? And then lastly, where are you in that story? You can answer all these questions or none of them, um, or maybe just one of them. But I open it up to us all to share that wondering. Um, we've got about maybe 10 minutes of wondering. So. What part, what is the best part of the story for you? What's the most important part of the story for you? Which part would you like to miss out and why? And where are you in this story? I wonder. Everyone's gone quiet. I think that for me, for me, the best part of the story is realizing that Nicodemus, even though he's got lots of knowledge, still has questions to ask. And he is a bit shy about asking <clears> him in public, so he goes round the back. So he makes him really human as well. So maybe even the most learned people have questions about faith and God. The best part of the story for me um, is the fact that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Um, um, in the Beatitudes, it says that, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And although Nicodemus was a religious one, a pious one, he still hungered and he thirsted after righteousness. And that, that is why he came to Christ. And he said, you are a teacher in Israel. And of course, he was very surprised when Jesus gave him the answer to the conundrum and answered the question. Thanks, Gerald. I think what came over to me as the best part is um, Nicodemus was a very learned man. He, he knew. Um, you know, he, he knew the, 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 the laws of Israel and, and 
and and and you know the, the old Bible testaments, but that can on occasions harden your mind to not opening up your 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 heart and mind to the, to what it all means. Um, and you know, however, um, whatever level of um, faith or or whatever level of of education you may have, there's always something additional to learn, uh, particularly in God's message. Um, and you need to have an open mind at all times to listen to what he's telling you um, and not be too um, regimented in your opinions that may have grown over the years. Yeah, thanks, Gwen. I think the, the um, obviously the most famous uh, verse in the Bible, as you said, Julie, is uh, John 3.16, but the verse that follows it is important as well, uh, where Jesus said he didn't come to condemn, but to save. And I think we, we need to remember that, that Jesus accepts us with unconditional love, uh, wherever we are, whatever we are doing, that he is there and he's ready to receive us. Not, not going to condemn us, he's going to save us. And that, I think, is a wonderful message. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Barbara, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, <coughs> sorry. What I find confusing in it all is that you can't get to the kingdom of God unless you've been saved. This is basically what that Bible scripture is telling us. And yet, as Peter just said, traditionally, you know, and will accept us at any time. So this is what I find confusing about, uh, I think everybody hopes that they will go to heaven, but you would like the reassurance have you done something in your life which will reassure you or have you still not done the right thing to be able to get there you know when something mm. like this comes up that's what i wonder about if mm. that makes sense oh yes yes thank you barbara i i think to be saved barbara you simply <laughs> if that's the right word for you simply got to believe in god and, and love God with all your heart and all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So you, you are doing what God is telling you to do by sharing your love with your neighbor, whoever that may be, and you're saved. Oh, thank you, Gwen. <laughs> oh, so we I'm not saying I'm right, mate. <clears throat> we have to go back to <laughs> Jesus said, Jesus. and Jesus said, he must be born again. Now, you see, that is a particular crisis in a person's life. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. You cannot love God with all your heart and soul and mind. And certainly cannot love your neighbor as yourself unless there is that work of a new birth, which is the work of the Holy Spirit. You see? Uh, later on, Jesus says to Nicodemus, he said, he that believeth is not condemned. But he that does not believe is already condemned. You see, we are naturally in a place of condemnation. And it is only by receiving Christ as our Savior that we come out of condemnation and we come into acceptance with God. You see? So we have to take the whole passage and look at the context of that. Yeah. Thank you. I want. I mean, I, I sometimes think that's the bit that maybe we will want to miss out because it's difficult. And, yeah. and um, yeah. certainly for me, I would want to miss out because it's difficult. But I think for me, I wonder if it's about having the openness to have the Holy Spirit within you. Um, mm. You might not have the words, but the Holy Spirit will give you the words. Um, Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I thought years ago, as a, a, a Christian, 
has to be good at all times, has to be of a higher standard than the rest of us. Um, but that's not the case. Um, I understand now that Christ is there for those who are broken, for those who fail. Um, and it's, it's, it's those people, like us all, he is there to, to save and to bring to salvation. Um, and the soul you have to do is to love him with all your heart and mind and to love your neighbour as yourself. Yeah. The main Maybe thing is the acceptance of Christ. And with the acceptance of Christ becomes the uh, born again, which is difficult for people to understand. Now, we've been brought up with the phrase to be born again. And I think a lot of people um, have different ideas about it. But most people, I would imagine, that are, if they're in the church understand um, some perhaps sometimes perhaps loosely what it means but to think that this was introduced to a man like Nicodemus must have been absolutely catastrophic because he didn't he had no conception of what Jesus was saying yeah but it's the, but it's the change in our lives the born again bit that is so important Oh, we, okay, we still got problems and we're still the same people, but there is a change and we are different once you've accepted Jesus. Maybe born again is the thing that's hardest to, if I was going to, so my one thing would be, if I was going to change a word in this passage, I would change born again, but I would maybe make it into transformed. Because I think that's what happens. That's the change. We are transformed by the Holy Spirit. So it makes it easier to understand, I think. Um, yeah. Anyone else get any other wonderings? What best part was the most important part? What bit you want to miss out? Where are you in the story? We haven't really touched on that. Where are we? I've already said I'm Nicodemus. <laughs> I think okay. and we really believe in what we read in the Bible and we know that Jesus is Jesus, the Spirit is the Spirit, and God is God, all in one. And sometimes certain words, when you hear them in a sermon or when you hear them sung as many times, and you just feel this emotion inside you. And you feel that the spirit is there. And sometimes I feel I am, the tears run from my eyes because it is so marvelous to have God with us all the time. Thanks. Can I have one last word, uh, Judy? I want to yeah. make the comparison between Nicodemus and Reverend John Wesley and, of course, his brother Charles, because they, like Nicodemus, were very religious, very pious, very charitable as well. But um, John Wesley knew that he wasn't right with God, but all of the works that he was doing wasn't right until he had that experience on the 24th of May, 1738. And he said in his journal about the word of God, but then he said that I really did believe that Christ had died for me. Not just that Christ had died for other people, he had died for me, he said. So it became personal to John Wesley at that particular point. And, but the search had come to the crisis point, you see. So there is a parallel between John Wesley and Nicodemus. Mm. Yeah. I mentioned this last week, um, and D.L. Moody said that he could convert thousands of people to Jesus, but if he didn't have the ticket, then he wouldn't experience yeah. eternal life. That's right. He, he mentioned as a, the ticket, but I mean, it's the same thing that we're talking about now. Yeah. Uh, John Wesley, in his journal, 
on the way back from America, uh, from the colonies yeah. of America. <coughs> uh, before that experience, he wrote in a journal. He was a very disappointed, very disillusioned man at that point, and he wrote in his journal, I went to the Americas to convert the Indians, but who will convert me? And I think that gives the indication of the state of John Wesley's soul at that time. Who mm. will convert me, he said. Yeah. Thanks. I'm learning an awful lot about John Wesley. I don't, because I'm not a Methodist. I do yeah. Not growing up in that. It's wonderful. <laughs> and we're going to sing again, and and then we're going to have a short prayer. So we're going to sing a song by John Hardwick. It does have sign language in it. So if you if you feel you want to do the signs, then feel free to do that. Um, and it is based on the verse "For God so loved the world." So I'm going to share my screen again. I can get it to move on. No, we don't want that. Let's share a prayer together. God of the living world, for the truth that invites us in to an embrace, for the questions that echo our own, for the conversations that puzzle and enlighten us, for the encounters that inspire and inform us, for the certainty, the mystery and the grace. God who loves the world. As the shape of this global pandemic changes, we pray for our world, for the unity across the globe that will bring an end to the crisis. God of the displaced and the hopeless, 
as the human cost of tragedy in the migration crisis across Europe becomes something of a forgotten headline. Help us to view displaced people with kindness and care, and despite the political and social complexities, to be people who offer welcome and warmth. God of justice, we pray for those in our world who face injustice, for people whose lives are in danger because of the colour of their skin or their beliefs or because of their difference. God of salvation, we thank you for the freedom we find in you. As so many of our young people come to the end of their formal schooling this week, and face freedom of summer holidays. May our teenagers who are struggling with mental health issues find help and start to heal. God of eternity, thank you that you love this world so much you gave us your son. Help us to keep adventuring with you. May we allow ourselves to be filled with visions of your awesomeness. And may we know your presence closer to us than its own breathing. Thank you for creating us, for being visible to us in Jesus, for inspiring and empowering us with your interweaving spirit. God of eternity, hear our prayer. And let's share the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Thank Jesus Lord Christ. Lord. And the love of God, love God and the fellowship and the of the Holy Spirit be with us be all, with us all. Evermore. evermore. Amen. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Judy. Very Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy.